Good evening, everybody. If you will, let's go ahead and begin tonight. We're in the book of Hebrews. For those of you that are regularly in Mr. Richard's class, we're in Hebrews chapter 12. So if you will, turn in your Bibles there, and we're going to cover that chapter the best that we can tonight. Mr. Gary got into the first few verses last week, but I do want to pick up reading there in verse 1 just to get our minds right um, as we get further on into the chapter. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I just want to make a quick comment. When you remember back to the chapter previous to this, Hebrews chapter 11, if you notice, when you read through that, there seems to be an emphasis on those faithful examples. They were looking where? Forward. They were looking forward to something. Forward to the promises. Forward to a better home. All these different places. But there seems to me, at least, that there is an emphasis of those faithful examples looking forward. These Christians were wanting to look back to Moses. They were wanting to go back to the law. And so he says, where do we focus our eyes? We look forward specifically to Jesus. How do you get through this difficult life? You focus on Jesus. So going on there in verse 3, he says, consider Him. It's kind of the same idea that he has there in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, consider Him, consider Jesus who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So, this gives us a little insight into the original audience that this sermon was delivered to, or this letter was written to. Um, They had been going through some struggles, as we've mentioned. Specifically what, I'm not really sure, but he tells us they had not yet resisted to the point of bloodshed. Uh, I tend to believe that these were Christians who were being ostracized, who were being shamed for their faith in Christ. And so they were maybe being pushed to go back towards the law. And so that is the type of struggles that these Christians were going through. Now starting in verse 5, And going through really verse 11, he's going to endeavor to explain to these Christians the importance and the purpose of us going through struggles. Now, keep in mind a couple of things before we get into these verses. Number one, within the context of Hebrews, as I just mentioned, this is a very specific type of struggle, a very specific type of um, difficulty that they're going through. They're being uh, shamed and going through struggles for being Christians, for having faith in Christ. So I don't think it necessarily, uh, at least within this context, is talking about all of the type of struggles and things that we can go through in life. However, I do think some of these things that we're going to talk about can apply to that. Now the other thing I want us to mention before I read these verses is what does the world tell you about suffering and going through struggles? There are a couple of responses in our world today. Most commonly, when we go through difficult times, or when people go through difficult times, we start questioning about God's love for us, don't we? I don't know if any of you have gone through something that has caused you to believe that, or to think that, or question that, but that is a very common response. Another way that the world interprets our suffering on this earth is what? Well, God doesn't exist. So those are the two types of mindsets that the world has when we're going through suffering and we're going through trials. Well, these verses are at least in part going to help us understand why we go through some trials and why we suffer at times. So let's read starting in verse 5. And have, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves, 
and chastises every son whom he receives. That is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3. Mr. Gary mentioned a little bit about this last week. Um, You know, sometimes the idea of discipline or going through a struggle carries a negative connotation, doesn't it? Well, really, the author is going to emphasize the positive side of that, that it's meant to train us. It's meant to discipline us. And so we'll see that as we go through uh, these next few verses. Verse 7, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So, reason number one that God allows us or God disciplines us when we're going through suffering and difficult times is we're we're being treated as sons. We're being treated, really, as the same way that the son was treated. Where was God when Jesus was on the cross? He was right there, allowing him to go through that, wasn't he? In Hebrews chapter 2, we learn that God used that suffering to perfect Jesus, to complete him to be our high priest. And so, in in, in a very real sense, when we are going through these things, God is treating us the very same way that he treated his son. And so... He uses the the culture of the time back then to compare that idea uh, to an illegitimate child. During that time, an illegitimate child did not have any right to receive their in, an inheritance, and because of that, they were not trained, they were not taught, and they were not disciplined. And so they were not loved. They were not treated that way. Whereas a true son is disciplined. And so, think with me, when we go through these trials and we go through these difficulties, is that a testament to God abandoning us and not loving us? No, it's a testament to God treating us as part of His family. I think that's important to remember. I have a quote for you here on your notes I want to read to you. It says, The very things in this life that make us feel we have been deserted in life are actually the very things that teach us that we are His. You know, I, I'm, I still think, I guess, I'm relatively young, but I am old enough to know uh, all of us are going to go through difficult times, and it's a lot easier to think and say these things when you're not going through those difficult times. But I know enough to know that we need to put these type things in our minds now, so when we get in these difficult times, we remember God is there, and He's treating me as a son. And I think that's, that's important for us to remember. Uh, verse 9, Besides this, we have earthly fathers who discipline us, and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? This is a, a common type of argument style that he has used a couple of times that we've mentioned. The lesser to the greater. My dad disciplined me. And I respect him now on this side of it, especially now as a parent myself. Well, how much more should I respect my heavenly father? No matter how good I think my dad is, he doesn't compare to our heavenly father, does he? And that's what he goes on to emphasize. Look at verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. So us as heavenly fathers, are we perfect? No, none of us are. But yet, the kids still learn to respect their fathers because they train them, they discipline them. And How much more, that's the idea, how much more should we respect and love and honor our heavenly father who is always right, who always does what is good for us? These times that we go through ultimately are for our good. And that's hard to remember in those times, isn't it? But we need to remember, this is going to end up helping me at some point down the road. 
Uh, and so, point number two, really, he disciplines us or trains us that we may share in his holiness. So, in a sense, he is treating us as his son, but he's also wanting us to learn to be more godly as we go through these difficult times. Now, verse 11, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I can tell you this, there was never a time when that man right there handed out discipline that it wasn't painful. But standing here now, I'm thankful for every one of those times. Why? Whatever little good I may have in me, in large part is because of the training that was provided by him and my mother. Well, it's the same thing here. During that time, yes, it is painful. It's hard. But as we get past it and we grow, we can look back and we can see that it was a seed that was planted. And once it's allowed to grow, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. One book I read said that God's discipline is not like a rock or a lightning bolt that's thrown down from heaven. It's a seed. That's planted within us. And when it's allowed to grow, it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I find it interesting how many of us, when we're going through trials and we're going through difficulties, feel a little anxiety or a little worry. Am I the only one? Most of us do, right? But when we endure, which is what the Christians are trying to do, what He's wanting them to do, endure through that. Stay under it. Why? On the other end is a peaceful fruit of righteousness. I find that very fascinating that the difficulties that we can go through ends up providing something peaceful to us. And I think that is something that we need to hold on to. So, before we move on past into verse 12, I want us to think, how many of us in here avoid things so that we're not persecuted? A lot of us do, don't we? What are we ultimately avoiding? Well, we're avoiding being treated as a son of God. We're avoiding becoming more godly. And we're avoiding growing and maturing and getting past that and yielding the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so, like I said a moment ago, it's easy for me to say that right now. I'm not really in danger of anybody putting me in a difficult situation right here. But what happens when I go out into the world and there's somebody that I need to talk to the gospel about? Do I do it or do I avoid it because of the the potential persecution that comes along with it? I think remembering these things may help us have the courage to endure like these Christians needed to endure. So, starting there in verse 12, he's going to tell the response uh, a little more, uh, give them a little more of a response to the difficult times that they're going through. Verse 12, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame <coughs> may, be, um, may be put out of joint, may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So there's a couple of things that he uh, encourages us to do. Number one, uh, lift our drooping hands, strengthen our weak knees, and make straight our paths. Now, a couple of the words in there suggest this is not an individual task. For example, the word for strengthen is a plural imperative. I don't really understand all that's involved with that. I do know plural means multiple. Imperative means it's necessary. But the idea here is that it implies a joint effort by many. In other words, I don't have the responsibility to lift and strengthen my own weak knees. All of you have to help me strengthen my weak knees. And the same goes for all of you. I have a responsibility to help strengthen your weak knees when you're going through difficult times. And so the idea in these verses is a a, a combination of effort by multiple people. Um, 
There in verse 13 when he says, make, uh, make straight paths, that is a little foreign to us. Uh, back in that time, they, of course, traveled, most people traveled by foot. Um, and so the paths that they walked were not always great. And a lot of times, the paths that were really the best ones were ones that were prepared for royalty to come along. Um, and so the point is, though, it took a lot of diligent and a lot of effort, a lot of work to make a path straight. And it's the same thing. Yes, as we go through these times, sometimes it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to endure through those times. But we're, that's what we're all here together for, is to help all of us be able to endure through those difficult times. Then in verse 14, he says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I want to emphasize just for a moment this idea of striving for peace with everyone. Uh, this is not uh, the lone verse that talks about this. Paul talks about this in, in Romans. I think Romans chapter 12. Um, he, he tells that we need to Try to be at peace with everyone. As much as it is within us, try to be at peace with everyone. How different is that than what the world, the way the world behaves right now? What does the world say? Oh, it's all about me. And if you offend me, how, how are you going to offend me today? And if you do that, guess what? I have nothing to do with you anymore. I don't want to be around you. I don't want to see you. As a matter of fact, I want harm to come to you. Well, guess what the response of a Christian is? We strive to be at peace with who? Not just people we like. Not just people that look like us. Not just people that we get along with. Not just people that agree with everything that we say. We strive to be at peace with everyone. Does that mean even people that want to hurt me? Yeah, it does. They're in everyone. And so I want, I want to challenge all of us and think about that. Do we really work at trying to be at peace with everyone? I think that's a challenge. And that is certainly one way that can distinguish us as the Lord's people from the rest of the world. I can tell you that right now. But he also says that we need to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. A moment ago, we just learned that one of the purposes of God disciplining us was that we could become more holy. And now we see that we need to strive for that. Well, what does that tell me? I need to greet these times. I need to welcome these times of, of suffering and trial. Why? Because I need to strive to be more godly. I need to be more like God. This idea of uh, striving for peace with everyone... Uh, and striving to be more holy reminds me of uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 5. I want to read just a couple of verses there real quickly where Jesus says, starting in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Hebrew writer just said, Without us becoming holy, we will not see God. Verse 9 Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so, uh, I find that interesting, that combination there uh, of these verses there with the Sermon on the Mount. Then going in verse 15, he says, See to it that no one fails to obtain uh, the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, to repent though he sought it with tears. And so our third response, um, in order, our third response to some of the trials that we go through um, is that we have a responsibility to see, see to it that no one fails. Um, excuse me. My throat is really dry tonight. 
that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Again, here's that joint effort. I have to look around, I have to see to it that no one fails to obtain it. Nobody includes who? Everyone. It's my responsibility to try to help everyone obtain the grace of God. And what a great responsibility that is. Now, this idea of no one being uh, a, a, a root of bitterness, uh, that is a quote back to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Um, and, and the Israelites there at the border of Canaan, and Moses is giving them instructions to, to heed the word of the Lord, not turn away from God. And he describes anyone who refuses that as a bitter root. And the emphasis there is that that bitter root can spread and cause trouble among all of Israel. Well, the same applies here. Listen to what he says. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And so, why do we look around at everybody? Why is it my responsibility to try to help everyone obtain the grace of God? Because if one root of bitterness takes plant, who is in danger? Me? My family? Everyone else? That root can spread like poison. And so we have to see to it that no one has that type of heart and that type of mindset that would turn away from God and not listen to the words of the Lord. He gives us an example there, starting in verse 16, that no one is sexually or moral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. It's interesting to me that the Hebrew writer describes Esau as immoral. As far as I can tell, Mr. Gary may be able to tell you better than I can. Well, I know he can. Um, but the best that I can tell, I couldn't see any place in the Old Testament where Esau was described as immoral. Um, he's certainly described as ungodly, um, and he had the ungodly mindset. He was more worldly thinking, which is emphasized here. What did he give up just for a temporary relief? He gave up his God-given responsibility to be the head of the family. Why? Because he was hungry. But, uh, I guess he could be immoral because he married outside of the covenant family. I'm not sure. Um, but he certainly was one... Um, who was unholy and ungodly in his thinking. And that seems to be the emphasis here in these verses when he talks about Esau selling his birthright. And so the emphasis there, the application for these Christians as well as us, is we don't need to yield and give up in our temporary suffering and have temporary relief. We need to stay under it so that we can be more godly and that we can become closer to God and fulfill our responsibility that God has handed down uh, to us. So, he tells them very clearly their response and our response for each other during these difficult times. Now, I do want to get into verse 18 uh, and spend a few moments going through verse 18 through 24. In a sense, I think starting in verse 18, this is uh, the author's grand finale. These verses are absolutely beautiful to me. They're very powerful and they're very uh, uh, important, I think. He is going to, for the very last time, give one more comparison of what it was like under the law of Moses versus what it's like now with Jesus. And the emphasis is overwhelming. Why would you leave Jesus for Moses, for the law that was given under Moses? It is overwhelming when we go through these verses. And I think that's the emphasis that he's trying to make here. So, let's start reading in verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not... Endure, there's that word again, the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight 
that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now what is he talking about here? When? The voice of God when specifically? The giving of the law. In verses 18 through 21, he is using the law that was given by God at Mount Sinai. That is the scene that he takes our audience to and us is to Mount Sinai. And he's going to use that event to really stand for all of the law. Okay? And so he's describing the type of atmosphere that was there and what was going on to help us realize really what it was like under the whole law. Notice some of the things that he says. You have not come. When we read when we there in verse... Uh, in verse 18, and then you go down to verse 22, the idea of having come, have come, guess what that is? We've seen this a couple of times in, the, in this book. It's drawing near. It's the idea of drawing near. And so we have not drawn near to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. When you go back, and you read about what was happening at Sinai, it was a very frightful scene, wasn't it? You had smoke, you had fire, you had the voice of the Lord that they couldn't even stand to listen to. And so it's a very troubling scene. What would happen if they, couldn't, if they touched the mountain? They would die. They couldn't draw near to God. That's the idea. Verse 19, And the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. That word for beg, we're going to see again in just a moment in verse 25 when he says, See that you do not refuse Him. That paints a little different picture of the attitude of Israel at the mountain, doesn't it? They refused to listen to the Word of God. It was too much to handle for them, wasn't it? And so what did they do? They asked Moses to mediate between them and God. They couldn't even bear to listen to the words that were being spoken. Verse 20, For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Even Moses, who met with God face to face, trembled with fear. Now, let's have our comparison. Starting in verse 22, he's going to tell us about how it's like with Jesus. Verse 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Just even to our ears, without even understanding the depth of the meaning of these verses, these verses sound a lot better than what was read in 18-21, through 21, doesn't it? Notice some of the descriptions that we talked about just a moment ago. A blazing fire, darkness, gloom, can't even stand to get near the mountain, can't hear the words of the Lord. But now, where have we come? We've come to Mount Zion. What is that a reference to? Well, Zion in the Old Testament was the, originally was the hill of the Jebusite stronghold that David would go on to conquer and it would later become Jerusalem, and it would end up standing for the city, the whole city of Jerusalem. And so, in the Old Testament, it ended up having the seat of the priestly authority with the temple. It even had the, uh, the royal authority with the king there in the city of Jerusalem. And so that's why in a couple of places it's described as the Holy Hill of Zion. In the New Testament, what is it talking about, though? Revelations describes it as the New Jerusalem. He goes on to explain it for us. It is the heavenly Jerusalem. Notice what he says, uh, the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem. It's where God is. It's where we can go before the throne of God with 
boldness, compare that to what he just talked about at, at Sinai. They couldn't even begin to approach the mountain without fear and trembling. But now we can become come before, we can draw near to the real seat, the throne of God, with confidence and with boldness. And to the innumerable angels in festal gathering. So, uh, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 33 describes how uh, 10,000 angels uh, were witnesses there to the covenant at Sinai. And then you go to Daniel chapter 7, and of course, uh, you know, this is not, a, 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 this is figurative, I, I would believe. Uh, but Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 talks about how there's 10,000 times 10,000 of angels around the throne of God in heaven. And so we have the idea is it's innumerable. It's a myriad of angels that are there around the throne of God. Now, notice how they what, what is happening there. There's innumerable angels in festal gathering. This is uh, the idea of uh, the words there for festal gatherings. Is the only, that's the only time those, that, that word is used in the New Testament. It's fascinating to me, and I don't know, I think I told Dad this, or maybe Mr. Gary, or both, I don't know. But it's, it's amazing to me the amount of times that we've gone through in the book of Hebrews that a word is found in this book that is used nowhere else in the New Testament. But this is one of those times. And of course, you can hear it, festal gathering. It's a celebration. That's what's happening in heaven. The angels are celebrating. What are they celebrating? I would argue that they're celebrating that we have the ability to draw near to the throne of God. They're excited about it. They're happy that, that what was not being able to be accomplished under the law of Moses, now through the Son, has been accomplished. And we have that ability to come to, uh, to Mount Zion. He goes on and he uh, says that we come to, in verse 23, uh, and to the assembly of the firstborn. Now, to mine and your ears, what does that make you think of? Assemb who, the assembly of who? Anybody. Jesus, right? When you hear firstborn, you think of who? Jesus. Mr. Gary, is that who that's talking about? <laughs> he, had, he, hit, he hit home on this with me. I had to call him three times to get him to explain this to me. So, the firstborn there is plural. The idea is it's firstborn one. So who's this talking about? It's talking about Christians. We are the firstborn ones. From what? Born from what? The death of sin. Paul helps us understand this a little bit. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians, yes sir. Chapter 2. I want to read a few verses real quickly here for us. Starting in verse 1, and you were what? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We have been born from the death that is the result of sin. And so here in Hebrews, the plural use of the firstborn, the firstborn ones, it's talking about Christians. In a sense, when we come to Mount Zion, when we become a part of the church, everybody is participating. Every, we're a part of everybody. That's what we are coming to. He goes on, uh, who are enrolled in heaven. Uh, there's numerous verses that talk about how our names are written in the book of life for those of us that are faithful. I like to think of it this way. Uh, this is going to be a great gathering that no one can take our name off the guest list. The only person that could do that is me. I'm the only one that could take my name off the guest list. 
There is no power or no person great enough to remove my name from that list of getting into heaven. How encouraging is that? Nothing can change that. What a wonderful thought that is. Then he goes on and says that we have come to God, the judge of all. So this description of God, uh, earlier in the chapter he described him as the Father, the Father of spirits, and now he describes him as the God, the judge of all. This reminds us of the importance of God's evaluation. What really matters in earth, in our life while we are here on earth? What is really the only thing that matters? It doesn't matter what anyone else really thinks of me. It matters what God thinks of me. That's it. I'm going to be evaluated by God. He's going to judge me based off of my life here on earth. We need to stay focused on that. God is going to be the judge. Not my friends. Not anyone else. Not even people that I love. Do I care what they think? Yeah, of course. But does it ultimately really matter? It matters what God thinks there on Judgment Day. And then he says that we have come to uh, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now, this is a very interesting thought to me. I don't want to get too far uh, down this road just, uh, just a little bit, but uh, it seems to me that this is talking about, uh, like for example, people that were discussed in Hebrews chapter 11, the faithful that have already moved on, that, have already, that are already passed, uh, passed on from this world. And they, in a sense, have already been made perfect. What does that made perfect mean? Well, within the book of Hebrews, it's talking about us reaching our, our, our end, our completed end, our, our goal. They have reached their goal. And so they, they, along with us, are coming to Mount Zion. When we gather together, when we assemble to worship before the Lord, Guess who else is doing it? These faithful Christians who have moved on. How wonderful of a thought that is. That in a sense, my grandparents are are still singing when I'm leading singing. Dale Ledbetter, the Hawkins, all these great people that we've known in our life. What an encouraging thought that is. And in a sense, they are still there, drawing near, as we are too. What a comforting thought that is. This, just for note, is the last time that the word perfect is used in this book of Hebrews. It has been used uh, several times as we've gone through this book. And this, in this verse, is the last time that it is used. Then in verse 21, I mean 24, he says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Of course, we would not be able to draw near to Zion. We wouldn't be able to draw near to the throne of God uh, without Jesus mediating through the new covenant, as we have established uh, through chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, and so forth and so on. And then he, he, he ends uh, his list uh, and in a way supplies importance to uh, the sprinkled blood of Jesus. Uh, at times when, when, when biblical writers or in Greek writing or, or things like that, when there was a list provided, as I understand it, the first in the list and the last in the list often meant importance. And so the last in this list is the sprinkled blood, um, uh, his sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood uh, of Abel. And so <clears throat> the blood of Abel... Uh, is said to have cried out for vengeance against uh, his murder, of course, that being his brother. Uh, but the blood of Christ calls for forgiveness, uh, cleansing of our guilty, evil consciences, and it opens up the way to heaven. And so, with this final comparison, as I mentioned just a moment ago, it really, really, I think, drives home the point of the whole homily, that the, the whole argument that the author is trying to make. I want to read for you a quote that really sums it up for you real quickly. In sharp contrast to Sinai, our coming to Mount Zion provides encouragement for coming boldly into the presence of God. The atmosphere at Mount Zion is festive. The frightening visual imagery 
uh, of blazing fire, darkness, and gloom fades before the reality of the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The cacophony of whirlwind, trumpet blast, and a sound of words is muted and replaced by the joyful praise of angels in festal gathering. The trembling congregation of Israel gathered solemnly at the base of the mountain is superseded by the assembly of those whose names are permanently inscribed in the heavenly archives. An overwhelming impression of the unapproachability of God is eclipsed in the experience of full access to the presence of God and of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So the question is, why in the world would you depart from Jesus? Why? When you, would you, why would you give this up? Why would you give up full access? That's the point that he's driving home. You may not think that that's important to you. It is. Why would we put anything on this earth before serving Jesus? Why? If we do, we're giving this up. That's the point. Now going on in verse 25, See to it, see that, uh, that you do not refuse Him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused... Uh, him who warned them on earth, how, uh, much less will we escape if we reject Him who warns from heaven. Again, that is that lesser to the greater. If they uh, were punished for refusing when, God, when He was warned from earth, when He warned them on earth, how much more will we be punished if we reject, if we turn our backs from the warning from heaven? There will be greater punishment. Verse 26 at that time, his voice shook the earth. That's talking about at Sinai. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made, in order that the things, the, the things that cannot be shaken may remain. What is the one thing that cannot be shaken? The kingdom. The church. Why? Because it belongs to God. It's His. Do you want to be a part of something that cannot be destroyed? That no matter what, no matter what happens on earth, it's going to be there. I do. That's the kingdom that belongs to God. The one that was purchased with Christ's blood. Verse 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So instead of having the root of bitterness that can spread, we realize the blessings that we have in Jesus. And that calls us to have a grateful attitude and leads us to worship Him with reverence and, in all, and with all. Okay, we're going to stop there and we're going to hit chapter 13 next week and we'll be done with this wonderful book. Thank you for your attention.